the world's first 747. It's the early 1970s, and you are flying on a brand new plane, the luxurious 747. You can't believe what you see in front of you. The large airplane is as large as a five-story building. No, larger actually. The airline, Pan Am, or Pan American World Airways. That is how I believe uh, people must have felt when the first 747 flight with Pan Am took place. Now let's talk more about Pan Am, the unofficial national airline of the US. Let's talk about it. Pan Am was founded on the 14th of March 1927 as Pan American Airways. Pan Am started its South American route with a consolidated Commodore and Sikorsky S-38 flying boats. The S-40, larger than the 8-passenger S-38, began flying for Pan Am in 1931. Carrying the nicknames American Clipper, Southern Clipper and Caribbean Clipper, they were the first of the series of 28 clippers that symbolized Pan Am between 1931 and 1946. On the 5th of July 1937, survey flights across the North Atlantic began. Tribe decided to start a service from San Francisco, Honolulu, and on to Hong Kong and Auckland following steamship routes. Tribe, by the way, was the CEO of Pan Am. After negotiating traffic rights in 1934 to land at Pearl Harbor, Midway Island, Wake Island, Guam, and Manila, Pan Am shipped $500,000 worth of aeronautical equipment and construction crews westward in March of 1935 using the SS North Haven, a 15 ton, no, a 15,000 ton. I'm not sure if that's 15 or I think it's 15,000 ton merchant ship chartered for the purpose of provisioning each island that the clippers would stop at in on their four to five day flight. Pan Am ran its first survey flight to Honolulu in April of 1935 with a Sikorsky S-42 flying boat. The airline won the contract for a San Francisco to Canton Mail Road later that year and operated its first commercial flight carrying mail and express in a Martin M130 from Alameda to Manila amid media fanfare on the 22nd of November 1935. The five leg 8,000 mile or 13,000 kilometer flight arrived in Manila on the 29th of November and returned to San Francisco on the 6th of December, cutting the time between the two cities by the fastest scheduled steamships by over two weeks. The fare from San Francisco to Manila or Hong Kong in 1937 was US dollars one way, which is about $19,340 in 2022. On the 6th of August 1937, Yuan Tribe accepted United States Aviation's highest annual prize, the Collier Trophy, on behalf of Pan American Airways from President Franklin D. Roosevelt for the company's establishment of the Trans-Pacific Airline and the successful execution of extended overall to navigation and the regular operations thereof. Th th that was a mouthful. Anyways, six large long-range Boeing 314 flying boats were delivered to Pan Am in early 1939. On the 13th of March 1939, the Yankee Clipper, piloted by Harold E. Gray, made the first ever transatlantic passenger flight. The first leg of the flight, which was from Baltimore to Horta, took 17 hours and 32 minutes and covered 2,400 miles or 3,900 kilometers. The second leg from Horta to Pan Am's newly built airport in Lisbon took 7 hours and uh, 7 minutes and covered 1,200 miles or 1,900 kilometers. Pan Am also used Boeing 314 flying boats for their Pacific routes. Pan American Airways also started a route to 
Marcel France. The Clippers, the name harkened back to the 19th century fast sailing Clippers, were the only American passenger aircraft of the time capable of intercontinental travel. To compete with ocean liners, the airline offered first class seats on such flights, and the style of flight crews became more formal. Instead of being leather jacketed, silk scarfed airmail pilots, the crews of the Clippers wore no- naval styled uniforms and adopted a set procession. I don't know what procession means, actually. But anyway, uh, when boarding the aircraft. In 1940, Pan Am and TWA both received and began using the Boeing 307 Stratoliner, the first pressurized airliner to enter service. The Boeing 307's airline service was short-lived as all were commandeered for military service when the United States entered World War II. During World War II, most Clippers were pressed into military service. In January of 1942, the Pacific Clipper completed the first circumnavigation of the globe by a commercial airliner, and it was by complete accident. Paper Skies has a fantastic video about that. Seriously, I remembered it randomly like many months after I watched it, and I could still kind of remember the title. It's a great video. Go watch it. Anyways, another first occurred in in January of 1943 when Franklin D. Roosevelt became the first US president to fly abroad in the Dixie Clipper. During this period, Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry was a Clipper pilot. He was aboard the Clipper Eclipse when it crashed in Syria on the 19th of June 1947. The growing importance of air transport in the post-war era meant that Pan Am would no longer enjoy the official patronage it had been uh, afforded in pre-war days to prevent the emergence of any meaningful competition, both at home and abroad. Although Pan Am continued to use its political influence to lobby for protection of its position as America's primary international airline, it encountered increasing competition first from American export airlines across the Atlantic to Europe and subsequently from others including TWA to Europe, Braniff to South America, United to Hawaii and Northwest Orient to East Asia as well as five potential rivals to Mexico. American Overseas Airlines was the first airline to begin regular land plane flights across the Atlantic on the 24th of October 1945. And I think that made Pan Am a little mad because in uh, January of 1946, Pan Am scheduled seven DC-4s a week, a week, east from LaGuardia Airport, five to London and two to uh, Lisbon. TWA's impending introduction of its faster pressurized Lockheed constellations resulted in Pan Am ordering its own constellation fleet at seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a piece that's not pocket change um kind of expensive anyway pan am began transatlantic constellation flights on january 14th of 1946 beating twa by three weeks in january of 1946 a flight from miami to buenos aires took 71 hours and 15 minutes in a pan am dc3 but the following summer dc4 flew flew idle while to buenos aires in 38 hours and 30 minutes while being modern-day JFK Airport. In January of 1946, Pan Am had no Trans-Pacific flights beyond Hawaii, but they soon resumed those flights with DC-4s. In June of 1947, Pan Am started the first scheduled round-the-world airline flight. In September, the weekly DC-4 was scheduled to leave San Francisco at 10 p.m. on a Tuesday as Flight 1, stopping at Honolulu, Midway, Wake, Guam, Manila, Bangkok, and arriving in Kolkata on Monday at 12.45 p.m., where it met Flight 2, a constellation that had left New York at 9.30 p.m. on Friday. The DC-4 returned to San Francisco as Flight 2. The constellation left Kolkata at 13.30 on a Thursday, no, Tuesday, and stopped at Karachi, Istanbul, London, Shannon, Gander, and arrived at LaGuardia on a Thursday 
at 2.55 p.m. All Pan Am around the world flights included at least one change of plane until Boeing 707s took over in 1960. In January of 1950, Pan Am American Airways Corporation officially became Pan American World Airways, though the airline had begun calling itself Pan American World Airways in 1943. In September of 1950, Pan Am completed the $17.45 million dollar purchase of American Overseas Airlines from American Airlines. That month, Pan Am ordered 45 McDonnell Douglas, at the time only called Douglas, DC-6Bs. From June of 1954, DC-6Bs began replacing DC-4s on Pan Am's internal German routes. Pan Am introduced the Douglas DC-7Cs on transatlantic routes in summer of 1936. Now, when I said DC-7C, and then after that said 7Cs, it might have sounded like I repeated myself, but no. The DC-7C was called 7Cs. That's a bit confusing, anyway. In January of 1958, the DC-7C non-stop took 10 hours and 45 minutes uh, from Idlewild to London, enabling Pan Am to hold its own against TWA's Super Constellation and Star Liners. Pan Am considered purchasing the world's first jetliner, the British de Havilland Comet, but instead waited to become Boeing 707 launch customer in 1955, with an order of 20. It also purchased 25 McDonnell Douglas DC-8s, at the time still called Douglas. I keep on saying McDonnell Douglas because that's what I'm used to saying most of the time, but no, this is just Douglas. Anyway, it pressed 25 Douglas DC-8, which could seat six uh, seats across. The 707 was originally to be 144 inches, at least I think it's 144 inches, anyway, or 3.66 meters wide, with five abreast seating, but Boeing widened their design to match the DC-8s. Pan Am's first scheduled jet flight was from New York, Idlewild, to Paris, Libreguet, stopping at Gander to refuel, which happened on the 26th of October, 1958. The Boeing 707-121 Clipper America registers November 711 Papa Alpha carried 111 passengers. 320 Intercontinental series of the Boeing 707s was delivered in 1959 to 1960 and the Douglas DC-8 in March 1960, enabling non-stop transatlantic crossings with a viable payload in both directions. Pan Am was a Boeing 747 launch customer, placing a $525 million order for 25 in April of 1966. Now, you might not know this, but Pan Am was one of the reasons why the 747 was even built, as they wanted a plane with more seats than the 707. Fun fact. Anyway, on January 15th of 1970, First Lady at Pat Nixon christened Pan Am Boeing 747 Clipper Young America at uh, Washington Dollars, and during the next few days, Pan Am flew 747s to major airports in the United States where the public could tour them. Pan Am's inaugural 747 service on the evening of January 21st, 1970, was delayed for several hours by engine failures, affecting the schedule Clipper Young America. Clipper Victor was substituted for the flight from New York, John F. Kennedy to London Heathrow. Now, fun fact, if you don't know, Clipper Victor was destroyed seven years later as it collided with a KLM Boeing 747, which was taking off from Tenerife in the Tenerife Airport disaster. The deadliest plane crash ever, if you don't count 9-11, as that was several plane crashes. Pan Am carried 11 million passengers over 20 billion miles, or 32 billion kilometers, in 1970, the year it introduced widebody airline travel. Pan Am was one of the first three airlines to sign options for the Aerospatial BAC Concorde, but like other airlines that took out options with the exception of BOAC and Air France, it did not purchase the supersonic jet. Pan Am was the first US airline to sign for the Boeing, Boeing 2707, 
the American Supersonic Transport Project, with 15 delivery positions reserved. These aircraft never saw service after Congress voted against additional funding in 1971. It would have been fun to see a supersonic American plane. I think Mustard has a good video about that. Anyway, Pan Am commissioned IBM to build Panamac. Interesting name. Which was a large computer that booked airline and hotel reservations, which was installed in 1964. It also held large amounts of information about cities, countries, airports, aircraft, hotels, and restaurants. The computer occupied the fourth floor of the Pan Am building, which was the largest commercial office building in the world for some time. The airline also built Worldport, a terminal building at John F. Kennedy Airport in New York. The terminal was designed to allow passengers to board and disembark via stairs without getting wet by parking the nose of the aircraft under the overhang. The introduction of the jet bridge made this feature obsolete though, so not the best decision. Anyway, at its peak in the late 1960s and early 1970s, Pan Am advertised under the slogan the world's most experienced airline carried 6.7 million passengers in 1966 and by 1968 its 150 jets flew to 86 countries on every continent except for Antarctica over a scheduled route network of 81,410 unobligated miles. I don't know what that means but anyway, which is 131 thousand kilometers during that period the airline was profitable and its cash reserve totaled one billion dollars a lot of money most routes were between new york europe and south america and between miami and the caribbean aside from the dc-8 the boeing 707 and 747 the pan am jet fleet included boeing 720bs and 77s which was the first aircraft to sport pan am rather than Pan American titles. So basically it just wrote Pan Am instead of Pan American. Anyway, the airline later had Boeing 737s, 747 SPs, Lockheed L-1011 Tristars, McDonnell Douglas DC-10s, A300s and A310s. Pan Am had a financial interest in the Falcon Jet Corporation, which held marketing rights to the dissolved Falcon 20 business jet in North America. Pan Am also participated in several notable humanitarian flights. And at its height, Pan Am as well, uh, was well regarded for its modern fleet and experienced crews hired from around the world, frequently with nursing training. From 1950 until 1990, Pan Am operated a comprehensive network of high-frequency short-haul scheduled service between West Germany and West Berlin. First with Douglas DC-4s, then with DC-6Bs from 1954 and uh, 727 from 1966. This had come about as a result of an agreement among the United States, the United Kingdom, France and the Soviet Union at the end of World War II, which prohibited Germany from having its own airlines and restricted the provision of commercial air services from and to Berlin to air transport providers headquartered in these four countries. That um, I said the names of just like uh, less than a minute ago. Anyway, the airlines West Berlin operation consistently accounted for more than half of the city's entire commercial air traffic during that period. That's a lot. For years, more passengers boarded Pan Am flights at Berlin Tempelhof than at any other airport. Pan Am operated a Berlin uh, crew base of mainly German flight attendants and American pilots to staff its German flights. The German national flight attendants were later taken over by Lufthansa when it acquired Pan Am's Berlin route authorities. In August of 1953, Pan Am scheduled passenger service uh, flights to 106 airports. In May of 1968, to 122 airports. In November of 1978, to 65 airports. In November of 1985, to 98 airports. In November of 1991, to 46 airports. Pan Am had invested in a large fleet of Boeing 747s, expecting that air travel would continue to increase. It did not, as the introduction of many uh, white bodies, Pan Am and its competitors coincided with an economic slowdown. Reduced air travel after the 1973 oil crisis made the overcapacity problem 
Even worse, Pan Am was vulnerable with its high overheads as a result of a large, decentralized infrastructure. High fuel prices and its many older, less fuel-efficient narrow-bodies airplanes increased the airline's operating costs. Federal route awards to other airlines such as Trans-Pacific Route Case further reduced the number of passengers Pan Am carried and its profit margins. By the mid-1970s, Pan Am had racked up $364 million of accumulated losses over a 10-year period, and its debts approached $1 billion. So they went from having $1 billion to owing $1 billion. This threatened the airline with bankruptcy. Former American Airlines Vice President of Operations William T. Sewell who had replaced Najib Halabi as Pan Am president in 1972, began implementing a turnaround strategy, that being trimming the network by 25%, slashing the strong workforce by 30%, and cutting wages, introducing stringent economic and residual debt, and reducing the size of the fleet. These measures, aided by the use of tax loss credits, enabled Pan Am to avert financial collapse and return to profitability in 1977. Since the 1930s, Jorn Tripe had coveted domestic routes for Pan Am. Through the late 1950s and early 60s and in the mid-70s, there were talks of merging the airline with a domestic operator such as American Airlines, Eastern Airlines, Transworld Airlines or United Air Airlines. As rival airlines convinced Congress that Pan Am would use its political clout to monopolize US air routes, the CAP repeatedly denied the airline permission to operate in the US by growth or by merger with another airline. Pan Am remained an American carrier operating internationally routes only aside from Hawaii and Alaska. The last time Pan Am was permitted to merge with another airline prior to the deregulation of the US airline industry was in 1950 when it took over American overseas airlines from American Airlines. After deregulation in 1978, more US domestic airlines began competing with Pan Am internationally. To acquire domestic routes, Pan Am under President Sewell set its eyes on national airlines. Pan Am wound up in a bidding war with Frank Lorenzo's Texas International that boosted national stock price, but Pan Am was granted permission to buy national in 1980 in what was described as the coup of the decade. The acquisition of national airlines for $437 million further burdened Pan Am's balance sheet, already under strain after financing the Boeing 747s ordered in the mid-1960s. This acquisition did little to improve Pan Am's competitive position in relation to nimbler, low-cost competitors in a deregulated industry as National's North-South route structure provided insufficient feed at Pan Am's transatlantic and transpacific gateways in New York and Los Angeles. The airlines had incompatible fleets and corporate cultures they didn't mix well and the integration was poorly handled by Pan Am management, who presided over an increase in labor costs as a result of harmonizing national pay scales with Pan Am's. Although revenues increased by 62% from 1979 to 1980, fuel costs from the merger increased by 157% during a weak economic climate. As 1980 progressed and the airline's financial situations worsened, Sewell began selling Pan Am's non-core assets. The first asset to be sold off was the airline's 50% interest in Falcon Jet Corporation, which happened in August. Later in November, Pan Am sold the Pan Am building to the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company for $400 million. In September of 1981, Pan Am sold off its Intercontinental Hotels chain. Before this transaction closed, Sewell was replaced by C. Edward Aker, Air Florida's founder and ex-president as well as former Braniff International executive. The combined sale value of the Intercontinental chain and the Falcon Jet Corporation stake was 500 million. A lot of money. Not enough to save Pan Am, but a lot of money. Aka followed up the asset disposal program he had inherited from his predecessor with operational cutbacks. Most prominent among these was the discontinuation of the round the world service from October. 31st, 1982, when Pan Am ceased flying between Delhi, Bangkok, 
and Hong Kong due to this sector's unprofitability. To provide additional seating capacity for its 1983 spring-summer season, the airline also acquired three passenger Boeing 747-200Bs from Flying Tigers, who took four of Pan Am's 747-100 freighters in return. So three planes for four planes. Seems fine. Despite Pan Am's precarious financial situation in summer 1984, Acre went ahead with an order for new Airbus models in a white body and everybody aircraft, becoming the second American company to order Airbus aircraft after Eastern Airlines. In 1985, new A310 221s began replacing 77s on the internal German services, and the A300s flew in the Caribbean networks later that same year. From early 1986, additional new longer range A310 222s replaced some of the 747s on the slim down transatlantic network following ETAP certification approval by the FAA. Pan Am's decision not to take delivery of the A320s and to sell its delivery position to Braniff meant that the majority of its short-haul US domestic and European feeder routes and most of its German services continued to be flown with the obsolete 77s until the Allies' demise. Not a good move. In September of 1984, Pan Am American World Airways created a holding company called Pan Am Corporation to assume ownership and control of the airline and the services division. Given the airline's dire state, in April of 1985, Acre sold Pan Am's entire Pacific division, which consisted of 25% of its entire route system and their major hub at Tokyo Narita to United Airlines for $750 million. This sale also enabled Pan Am to address fleet and compatibility issues related to the earlier acquisition of National Airlines as it included Pan Am's Pratt & Whitney JT90 powered 747SPs, its Rolls-Royce RB211 powered L1011 500 and the General Electric CF6 powered DC10s inherited from National, which were transferred to United along with the Pacific routes. In the early 1980s, Pan Am contracted several regional airlines, those being Air Atlanta, Kalkan Air, Emerald Air, Empire Air Airlines, Presidential Airways and Republic Airlines to operate feeder flights under the Pan Am Express branding. The acquisition in of Pennsylvania-based commuter airline Ransom Airlines for $65 million was meant to address the issue of providing additional feed for Pan Am's main line services at its hubs in New York, Los Angeles, and Miami in the United States and in Berlin. In an attempt to gain a presence on the busy Washington to New York to Boston commuter air corridor, the Ransom acquisition was accompanied by the $100 million purchase of New York Air sh Shuttle service between Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C. This parallel move was intended to enable Pan Am to provide a high-frequency service for high-yield business travelers in direct competition with the long-established successful Eastern Airlines shuttle operations. Um, I have, all, by the way, already made a video about New York Air. Warning, it's one of my first... It, it, it is my first video of this style of content. So it's not great. You can watch it if you want. The renamed Pan Am Shuttle began operating out of LaGuardia Airport's refurbished historic marine air terminal in October of 1986. However, it did not address the pressing issue of Pan Am's continuing to lack of a strong domestic feed network. In 1987, Towers Financial Corporation, led by its CEO Stephen Hoffenberg and his consultant Jeffrey Epstein, unsuccessfully tried to take over Pan Am in a corporate raid with Towers Financial as their raiding vessel. Thomas G. Plaskett, a former American Airlines and Continental executive, replaced Aga as president in January of 1988. While a program to refurbish Pan Am aircraft and improve the company's on-time performance began showing positive results. On December 21st of 1988, the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 above Lockerbie, Scotland resulted in 270 fatalities, with a $300 million lawsuit filed by more than 100 families 
of the victims, the airlines subpoenaed records of six U.S. government agencies, including the CIA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the State Department. Though the records suggested that the U.S. government was aware of the warnings of a bombing and failed to pass the information to the airline, the families claimed that Pan Am was attempting, just attempting to shift the blame. Also, in December of 1988, the FAA fined Pan Am for 19 security failures out of the 236 that were detected among 29 airlines. In June of 1989, Plaskett presented Northwest Airlines with a 2.7 billion takeover bid that was backed by Bankers Trust, Morgan Guaranty Trust, Citicorp, and Prudential Batch, whatever that those names are. The proposed merger was Pan Am's final attempt to create a strong domestic network to provide sufficient feed for the two remaining mainline hubs at New York, JFK, and Miami. It was also intended to help the airline regain its status as a global airline by re-establishing a sizable trans-Pacific presence. The merger was expected to result in an annual savings of $240 million. However, billionaire financial financer Al Chechi outbid Pan Am by presenting Northwest's directors with a superior proposal. The first Gulf War triggered by the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait on August 2, 1990 caused fuel prices to rise, which severely depressed global economic activity. This in turn caused a sharp contraction of worldwide air travel demand, plunging once profitable operations, including Pan Am's prime transatlantic route, into steep losses. These unforeseen events constituted a further major blow to Pan Am, which was still reeling from the 1988 Lockerbie disaster. To shore up its finances, Pan Am sold most of its routes serving London Heathrow, which was arguably Pan Am's most important international destination, to United Airlines. This left Pan Am with only two daily London flights, serving Detroit and Miami, which both used Gatwick as their London terminal from the start of the 1990-91 winter time. Table. Further asset disposal included Pan Am's sale of its German route to Berlin to Lufthansa for $150 million, which became effective at the time and brought the total value of asset disposal up to $1.2 billion. That's a lot of money. These measures were accompanied by the elimination of 2,500 jobs. That's also a lot of jobs. These cutbacks were announced by the airline in September of 1990. Pan Am was though still forced to file for bankruptcy protection on the 8th of January 1991. Delta Airlines purchased the remaining profitable assets of Pan Am, including its remaining European routes and the Frankfurt Mini Hub, the shuttle operations, 45 jets, and the Pan Am Worldport at John F. Kennedy Airport for $416. Million dollars. Delta also injected $100 million, becoming a 45% owner of the reorganized but smaller Pan Am, serving the Caribbean, Central, and South America from a main hub in Miami. The airline's creditors would hold the other 55%. The Boston to New York, LaGuardia to Washington National Pan Am Shuttle Service was taken over by Delta in September of 1991. Two months later, Delta assumed all Pan Am's remaining transatlantic traffic rights except Miami to Paris and London. In November of 1991, all members of Pan Am's frequent flyer program World Pass were transferred with their accumulated miles to Delta's frequent flyer program Sky Miles. In October of 1991, former Douglas Aircraft Executive Russell Ray Jr. was hired as Pan Am's new president and CEO. As part of this restructuring, Pan Am relocated its headquarters from the Pan Am building in New York City to the new offices in the Miami area in preparation for the airline's relaunch from both Miami and New York on the 1st of November. The new airline would have operated approximately 60 aircraft and generated about $1.2 billion in annual revenues with 7,500 employees. But that did not work as following the relaunch, Pan Am continued to sustain heavy losses. Revenue throughout October and November 1991 fell short of what had been anticipated in the reorganization plan with Delta claiming that Pan Am was losing $3 million a day, which is a lot. This undermined Delta's Wall Streets and the traveling public confidence in the viability of the reorganized Pan Am. Pan Am's senior executive outlined a project shortfall of between $100 million and possibly $200 million, with the airline requiring a $25 million installment just to fly through the following week. 
On the evening of the 3rd of December, Pan Am's creditors committee advised U.S. bankruptcy just Cornelius Blackshear that it was close to convincing an airline to invest $50 million to keep Pan Am operating. A deal with TWA owner Carl Ichan could not be struck though, sadly. Pan Am opened for business at 9 a.m. and within the hour, Ray was forced to withdraw Pan Am's plan of reorganization and execute an immediate shutdown plan for Pan Am. Pan Am ceased operations on December 4th, 1991, following a decision by Delta CEO Ron Allen and other senior executives not to go ahead with the final $25 million payment Pan Am was scheduled to receive the weekend after Thanksgiving. How rude! The weekend after Thanksgiving? That, how rude! Uh, something good has just happened. You wanna, you wanna have something bad happen after Thanksgiving? Anyway, as a result, some 7,500 Pan Am employees lost their jobs. Thousands of people whom had worked in the New York City area and were preparing to move to the Miami area to work at Pan Am's new headquarters near Miami International Airport. Economists predicted that 9,000 jobs in the Miami area, including jobs at companies not connected to Pan Am that were dependent on the airline's presence, would be lost after it folded. The carrier's last flown schedule operation was Pan Am Flight 436, which departed that day from Bridgetown Barbados at 2 p.m. EST for Miami under the command of Captain Mark Pyle flying Clipper Goodwill, a Boeing 727-200 registered November 368 uh, Papa Alpha. Delta was sued for more than $2.5 billion on the 9th of December 1991 by the Pan Am Creditors Committee. Shortly thereafter, a large group of former Pan Am employees sued Delta. In December of 1994, a federal judge ruled in favor of Delta, concluding that it was not liable for Pan Am's demise, which is at least something. Pan Am was the third American major airline to shut down in 1991, after Eastern Airlines and Midway Airlines. How sad. Like, actually, I don't like when we lose airlines. It's sad to lose historic airlines. So let's have a moment of silence for these three and all the other islands that have shut down. Anyways, after serving only two months as Pan Am CEO, Ray was replaced by Peter McHugh to supervise the sale of Pan Am's remaining assets by Pan Am's creditors committee. Pan Am's last remaining hub at Miami International Airport was split during the following years between United Airlines and American Airlines. TWA's Carl Ichan purchased Pan Am Express at a court-ordered bankruptcy auction for $13 million, renaming it to Transworld Express. The Pan Am brand was sold to Charles Cobb, CEO of Cobb Partners and former United States Ambassador to the Republic of Iceland under President George H. W. Bush and under the Secretary of U.S. Department of Commerce under President Reagan. Cobb, along with the Hanna Frost Partners, invested in a new Pan American World Airways headed by veteran airline executive Martin Arsh. Shukri Jr., a former Pan Am executive with 20 years of experience at the original carrier. Now, if you want me to, I will make a video about the attempts to remake Pan Am. Under the terms of bankruptcy, the Airlines International Flight Academy in Miami was permitted to remain open. It was established as an independent training organization beginning in 1992 under its current name, Pan Am International Flight Academy. So yeah, you can still visit Pan Am, though it's a flight academy though it is also now owned by all Nippon Airways. In 1998, Gulf Ford Transportation Industries purchased Pan American World Airways and already doing names, rights and intellectual properties. The railway was later operated as Pan Am Railways. In 2022, the company was acquired by CSX Corporation. Korean fashion company SJ Group opened a Pan Am flagship store in Seoul in 2022 after acquiring a license to produce Pan Am branded apparel and accessories. It looks cool. Anyways, there is still more information, so... The three deadliest Pan Am crashes was Pan Am Flight 759 in third, Pan Am Flight 103 in second, and Pan Am Flight 1736 in first. Pan Am Flight 1736 is, by the way, the Tenerife collision. So that was the deadliest plane crash ever. Again, if you don't count, 9-11. And now we get to the part that is both my favorite part of the video, but in this case it might also be the worst. That is the aircraft that the airline operated throughout the years. Now there's so many that um, I will, that it, there's too many. So if you want to see me read all the aircraft that they had, I'll probably link a video in the description. But anyway, I'm now I'm only going to read 
the important ones. They had 7.314 aircraft. They had 13 Airbus A300B4s aircraft, 7 Airbus A310-200 aircraft, 8.707-120 aircraft, 85.707-320B aircraft, 9.720B aircraft, 46.727-100 aircraft, 16.737-200 aircraft, 44.747-100 aircraft, 7.747-200B aircraft, 1.747-200C aircraft, 11.747-SP aircraft, 9 Douglas DC-8 320s and 33 aircraft, um, 1 Douglas DC-8 62 aircraft, uh, 5 McDonnell Douglas DC-1030 aircraft, 3.307 uh, Stratoline aircraft, 20 Convair CV-240 aircraft, 90 Douglas DC-3 aircraft, 49 Douglas DC-6 aircraft, 2 Lockheed Model 9 Orion aircraft, 4 Lockheed Model 10 Electra aircraft. Lastly, something that I found, found very interesting, 80 Havilland Canada 7 aircraft. Um, remember early in the video when I said that that was a mouthful? I take that back. When I'm gonna read this whole thing, that is gonna be a mouthful. Because that, that was less than one fourth of the aircraft that I've got to say. If I ever decide to say all of them. And that's all. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you in the next video. Bye.